Being a beginner in Fortnite can seem like a daunting task. With so many competitive players out there who practice day and night to become the best, it can be difficult to see yourself rising to their level. But fear not. No matter how skilled they can be right now, they all started off having to learn the tricks of the trade. In fact, with the brand new season only a couple of weeks in, this is the perfect time to jump into competitive and start on an even footing with everyone else. What up, Fortnite fam? I'm Matt, back again to give you the latest tips and tricks to make you a better Fortnite player. Today, we're going to be going over the essentials to make sure you get off on the right foot during your first bout into competitive Fortnite. So, let's get you up to speed. Competitive Fortnite is all about training, keeping a consistent workout routine, and finding other players that can help you practice. However, when it comes to playing a match, there are three essential components you will need to focus on. You need a good loadout, a decent amount of building materials, and most importantly, a plan. Fortnite offers each player a variety of different options for the equipment they end up with by the end game. One of the basic expectations is that you will be aiming for epic and legendary loot while starting the game with commons and uncommon items. However, each weapon and item gives you a different way to tackle situations, and unfortunately, you can't just carry as much. This is when you need to pick and choose what your strategy revolves around. For example, do you want to pick off players from a distance? Then you're going to want to focus on using the sniper. Looking to fight players up close? Grab that pump shotgun and practice your accuracy. Right now, the latest addition to the game are the sideways weapons. These weapons can be found in the sideways or crafted using monster parts. Essentially, they pack plenty of punch the closer they come to overheating, and they don't require you to reload them. The other slew of weapons include the charged shotgun and the automatic sniper. The charged shotgun is great for choosing the amount of damage you deal. You can go for short bursts that deal less damage but take less time to charge, or larger chunks of damage that require patience and precision. The automatic sniper, on the other hand, is a great long-range weapon that can pick off opponents from a distance. What makes this sniper in particular so deadly is that you can fire multiple shots in a shorter amount of time. While it may not do as much damage per shot as some of the other snipers we've seen, the fire rate more than makes up for it. Did you know that last week we saw over 100 ProGuides.com users climb out of contenders and into champs? Well, guess what? Everyone has the potential to do exactly the same, including you. Unlock your Fortnite potential by visiting ProGuides.com through the link in the description today. We've got some of the best pro coaches in the world, and they're available 24-7 to start you on your journey into champs, no matter your current skill level. As a casual player, you can win a few games without ever having to build anything. You rely on the rarity of your weapons to pull you through. However, competitive is a whole different ball game. Here, how far you go depends on how quickly you can use building to your advantage. This means understanding the different building basics that will give you the upper hand. It also means that whatever you plan on doing during the match, you should also include gathering enough materials to that plan. There are three different building materials, wood, stone, and steel. As you can tell just by hearing what they are, each one has a different durability and come from different sources. The last thing you want to do in the middle of a competition is to find yourself completely out of building materials. This can leave you dead in the water if you're not careful. So be sure to manage your resources, don't waste material on builds that you don't need, and make sure to get materials whenever you get the chance. This will be important when you start mapping out your loot route for the game. Speaking of, one of the most important things to keep in mind when going into competitive is that landing spots matter. This will mark the beginning of your loot route. So what exactly makes for a good landing spot? Primarily, this is determined by the amount of chests in the area, what materials you can gather, as well as location. Really, it's up to a player to decide which landing spots work best for them. You also have to take into consideration how other players will be landing as well. It's nice to land all by yourself and take advantage of all the loot you can find nearby. However, the best landing spots will usually be contested, as different players try to do the same as you do. Luckily, there are also some secluded areas you can land on that yield less chests but are also less contested. This means that you will have less chances of having to fight over the starting loot and possibly getting eliminated because your opponent reached the loot first or you get third-partied by another player who happens to be hiding in the sidelines during your fight. This season, a variety of new landing spots have cropped up, and pros are discovering the unique benefits that they offer. So let's go over some to get you started. We keep mentioning the crash sites, and it seems every day there's a new reason to love this area of the map. One landing spot in particular would be the crash spot between Coral Castle and Pleasant Park. 
It has great rotation with the slipstreams and an abundance of chests and floor loot to get you all geared up. However, it can also be a fantastic place to get stone and wood. The rock formations in these areas are excellent ways of filling up your stone inventory. Each individual stone in the area can have up to 100 resources, making it easy to stock up and use later on during the match. With wood available in the form of dead tree branches, you can also fill up that meter as well for your weaker builds. Because of the abundance of loot in the area, there's always the chance that you'll be able to get a fishing rod or a harpoon. Because this crash site is so close to the water, you'll have plenty of opportunities to find fishing spots, which are a great source of ghost floppers and spicy fish. The Blue Cube is an interesting landing spot because it acts like Slurpy Swamp did, but is a whole lot better. You can find it near Misty Meadows and Catty Corner. With so many cubes falling on the island after the crash, one cube in particular is blue and can give you a nice boost at the start of the match. So what exactly does this Blue Cube do? Well, for starters, it is a quick source of free shields. If you can land on top of the cube, you can fill up your shields rather quickly, saving you the time that you would usually spend finding a big chug jug or allowing you to save the jugs you find for later. This area also has the chance to spawn up to four chests, so aside from getting your shields filled up, you have some pretty good access to loot. In walking distance from this landing spot is an IO base where you can score a vehicle as well as some guaranteed IO chests. You can also tear apart the walls and floors for some metal which will come in handy later when you want to create strong builds. From here on out, you'll have the means to go in any direction you choose, including the crash site that is just in driving distance from the base. Mini IO bases have been popping up all over the map, and you can barely spot them due to their size. Nevertheless, these can be a great opportunity to gather metal, vehicles, and an IO crate. One can be found near Rainbow Rentals, which contains everything we just mentioned, plus some slurp barrels which can help you fill up your shields. Not only that, but due to its proximity to the ocean, it also makes for a great way to gather fish. While you're there, also be sure to gather building materials from the furniture inside the beach cabins. With these spots in mind, you can practice landing and getting your loadout and building inventory ready as quickly as possible. The more you practice, the more familiar you'll become with the area and it'll all become second nature. If you're planning on competing, then be sure to have this location planned out ahead of time so you don't get caught off guard and drop in a random location. Always remember, preparedness is key. Fishing is important for more advanced plays. There are a variety of fish out there with the abilities to either heal you or refill your shields. However, there are two floppers in particular that you should keep an eye out if you're brand new to competitive and want to make the most out of Chapter 2 Season 8. The first of these is the Spicy Fish, which has the same effect as the Pepper by increasing your movement speed, but also heals you for 15 health. This is 10 health more than the average Pepper, and it lasts around 40 seconds. This can be used in the late game as the storm closes and you want to make those rotations, or have that extra boost in speed to either engage or run away from combat. The Shadow Flopper has two different effects. The first is to make you go into Shadow Mode, which is useful for a variety of different plays, specifically moving towards another part of the map quickly while in the air. It also heals a whopping 40 health. This in particular makes it much easier to use in a health kit, especially for healing quickly and then rotating out of the way. Season 8 gives us plenty of ways to rotate around the map. However, sometimes you're going to want to create your own space for redeploying. You can use this by using the bouncer tiles in your builds. Start by creating a ramp as high as you need it, then a platform at the end. Attach a bouncer to that tile and you'll be able to launch yourself into the air and redeploy, giving you another chance to glide down towards another section of the map. When used in combination with the Shadow Flopper, you can get some serious air and move around freely. The Shockwave Launcher is part of the latest updates to the game. Once again, we get another example of how much emphasis there is on rotation in Chapter 2 Season 8. The Shockwave Launcher works similarly to the Shockwave Grenades we've seen in the past. They act as a quick and easy way to launch yourself in any direction you wish. It can be great in a pinch, but it can also have another effect that can help you escape getting boxed in. When you launch yourself using the Shockwaves, you can break right through structures and builds. It's a clean way to move around and even gain the high ground if you need it. It can also be used to knock players in different directions so you can break their coordination or even knock them out into the storm. One of the things to keep in mind when planning out your loadout is that not all weapons and equipment will be available in competitive. 
When equipment gets vaulted, this is usually because it can be game-breaking in a competitive setting. The IO Recon gun, as an example, is capable of revealing enemies from a distance within a radius. If this were allowed in competitive, it would make players overpowered since getting the item guarantees that the team will have an easier time detecting enemies. Joining the equipment that isn't currently included in competitive are the symbiotes, so don't expect their canisters to show up during the match. If you're coming in fresh, then you may have come to learn that symbiotes have a wicked range for its attack, but also allow you to move around quicker and even redeploy when you've gained enough air. While this may seem like a fun item to pick up, competitive needs to be balanced, and it did not make the list. Also on this list are the armored walls. Just recently, these items were added to the game within the supply drops and as random floor loot. However, with a whopping 2,500 health, it makes the wall a pretty nasty obstacle that could trap you or your enemy in a pretty annoying situation. For now, the armored walls remain outside of competitive. It's important to know these details, because having an idea of what weapons are actually going to be in the loot pool for competitive will ensure that you aren't thinking like a casual player, and in turn, it will help you focus on mastering the items that actually matter. Now that you know more about the competitive season and where to begin, it's time to talk about Arena. You may have heard that the Arena grind has just begun, but what exactly does that mean, and why do so many players dedicate their time to it? Arena is a good way to practice during a match with other competitive players. These matches are usually more intense due to the skill levels of the players you go up against, but it also follows competitive rules, meaning that some weapons are vaulted during these matches. This gives you a good grasp of what to expect in terms of loot pool and skills you will encounter. Arena also has another function, which is to rank you and allow you to access certain competitions. You may have noticed that there are many open tournaments that occur per season. Some are open to everyone, however some are locked until you reach a certain level on Arena. Most, if not all, pros aim to reach the Champion League in order to qualify for the biggest events of the season and the more lucrative cash prizes. Okay, that's all for today, Fortnite fam. As the competition starts to pick up, we're going to be seeing plenty of new action. So to keep up with all the latest developments, don't forget to leave a like and ring that bell. Remember, now is the time to start getting into competitive. There's no better opportunity than at the beginning of a season. Once again, I'm Matt, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time.